Thank you very much, uh, Sofia, for uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you and all the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to be giving uh, uh, this keynote lecture to this you know, audience of uh, macroeconomists. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, a different angle on the business cycles. And that is uh, not the first moment, not the second moment, but the third moment. And usually we think about, you know, um, first moment, you know, first order, second moment, second order, third moment, third order. And uh, today the point I'm going to make is that sometimes the third moment can actually be first order and it can be more important than a first order shock to the economy. So um, uh, the results I'm going to um, uh, talk about today will be based on several papers with several different sets of co-authors and you know when 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 relevant i'm going to specify which result is from which paper uh, in case you want to follow up and look at more details uh, of the results so let me <clears throat> so if we think about how do we model business cycles uh, if you go back to you know 20th century um, the focus was mainly on aggregated fluctuations the first moment of variables. And the shocks that we considered were, again, aggregate shocks, you know, shocks to TFP, monetary shocks, financial shocks, and so on. Now, with the 21st century turn, uh, the focus shifted to heterogeneity. So we not only want to understand what happens to aggregates, but also what happens to the impact, uh, dif differential impact on different parts of the society. Uh, and with this focus, came uh, different ki kinds of shocks. So on the worker side, uh, you know, starting with a famous paper by Storestet and Telmer and Yaron in the JPE, uh, we started introducing countercyclical variants of income shocks that drive business cycle, uh, th that basically uh, generates large welfare costs of business cycles. On the firm side, uh, Nick Bloom, my co-author and several others in the literature they have looked at countercyclical variance shocks to firm level variables like TFP, for example. Now, today I'm going to talk about recent evidence. This is from the last you know, five years or so, and in many of them ongoing work. Uh, the shocks that I'm going to talk about to workers will be procyclical skewness shocks. The income shocks actually will not have the variance increase uh, during a recession, it will be the skewness that will become more negative. And the same will be also true for firms. Uh, and I will show you this both for shocks to firms like TFP shocks, as well as uh, the, the, the behavior of outcome variables. Now, before going, uh, before going for, forward, I'm sorry, this is getting stuck a little bit, okay. <clears throat> I want to give you a concrete example that motivates a lot of this work. Uh, if you look at the US Great Recession, you know, it's, a lot has been written about it. You know, hundreds of research papers uh, in policy circles in academia has been written about this. But this, this particular fact that I'm going to mention uh, is very telling about whether or not a third moment change can be reflected in a first moment change. So here is the statistic. During the Great Recession, over two years, US male workers, the mean change in wage income was minus six and a half percent over two years. And this is the largest decline in post-World War II uh, US history. That's why we call it a Great Recession. But the mean is, <laughs> Uh, not the median. It's not what happens to the average person in the economy. So what was the median income change during this time? Actually, it was positive. So how can this be? How can we have basically the, 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 the median person really not having an income fall during the greatest recession but when you focus on the aggregate, we think there's a very big decline in wages. The answer is because the wage distribution became much more left skewed. 
So a change in the shape of the distribution will translate into a measured fall in the first moment. Now, not only that, but during the same two years of the Great Recession, about 10% of workers had a 50% or more increase in their wage income. This is during the Great Recession, right? And about 10% had a 60% or larger fall in wage income. Now, why does that matter? Uh, it just gives you an idea about how dispersed the wage growth distribution is. Now, if you have a small variance, the mean becomes something meaningful to focus on because a lot of the workers that you are looking at will be close to the mean. But when the variance is so big, the a 6%, 7% change in the mean can actually come from what happens to the tails of this distribution. And this will be a common theme in my talk today. Uh, so today I'm going to ask three specific questions. The first one is, are skewness fluctuations a robust feature of US business cycles? By that, I mean both on the worker side, worker incomes, and on the firm side. So variables like sales growth, uh, employment growth, um, TFP shocks. You know, are the distributions of these key firm level variables also pro-cyclical over the business cycle? Uh, <clears throat> the second one, and the answer will be yes. <clears throat> the second question I will ask, is this true globally? Do we see this in other countries? And I'm going to show you some evidence on firms from a panel of 44 countries and on workers from uh, uh, the Global Income Dynamics Project, which basically covers 13 countries. And you see the same pattern repeated in, you know, uh, with almost no exception in all of these countries. And the third question is, does it matter? You know, if we are doing policy, macro policy, business cycle policy, should we actually care about this? And the answer will turn out to be yes. If you put the skewness shocks into a reasonable calibrated macro business cycle model, uh, you are going to get a first order effect on, on GDP, employment, uh, consumption, investment, and so on. <clears throat> so just to fix ideas, I think um, uh, a lot of people are familiar with, with uh, uh, skewness but sometimes I'm going to show you several figures. So let me make sure that actually we are all on the same page when I mean left skewed, right skewed, downward risk, you know, upside potential and so on. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Um, let's start with this uh, histogram of a variable. It can be annual sales growth. And suppose that in an expansion, it is symmetric. Oh. Uh, it's symmetric. So the skewness is zero. Now, one possible change that can happen in a recession that you know, um, all of you are familiar with is that you can have a positive variance shock in a recession. In other words, the variance can be counter cyclical. What does that entail? It, it's basically a small shift in the center of the distribution and an increase in the, the both tails. Now, there are two key points to note that I think are very important for understanding the macro implications of counter cyclical variance. The first one is when the variance goes up, it is not only the left tail or downside risk that increases, but the right tail also increases. So uh, keep this in mind. Okay, so depending on the objective function, this can actually be a good thing. Okay, the upside potential increases. Second, when you increase the variance, you are not changing the mean. Changing the second moment does not affect the first moment because it's symmetric. Okay, now this is a possibility that has been widely studied, used in a lot of papers and models. What is the alternative I'm going to talk about? It's that maybe it is not the variance that changes, it is the skewness that becomes more negative. So how does this look? Compared to this, both tails are expanding in the variance case. In the skewness case, the left tail does go to the left. 
So downside risk increases just like in a variance shock, but the right tail is very different. So on the right, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know why my computer is acting up a little bit. So could it be the connection? We're seeing, we're seeing everything fine. You are, okay, okay. Yes. Sometimes my slides jump for me. I apologize if it happens to you too. No, we see, it. We see them perfectly. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, so the downside risk also rises, uh, arises, but the upside surprise also become less likely. Now, what does not change is the center. The center of the distribution actually is very stable. This is the picture I showed you. The median almost doesn't change, but both tails swing to the left in a recession. What happens in expansion? The opposite, they swing right. <clears throat> So I want to, you know, in the interest of time, you know, uh, I may not be able to get through all the results I'm going to show you. I want to show you two key results, one on the worker side, one on the firm side uh, that, you know, summarizes uh, everything else I'm going to be discussing. So on the worker side, this is from uh, a paper that I had in the JP in JPE 2014 with uh, Sardar Özkan and Jay Song. We use the US Social Security Administration data. This is administrative data on earnings. And <clears throat> uh, the, the, the blue line is the real histogram of uh, uh, earnings growth, annual earnings growth averaged over US expansions. And the red line is the log earnings growth averaged over US recessions. And you see clearly the shift towards negative skewness here. Okay, the left tail uh, on the left is expanding and on the right, it is shrinking. Now the magnitudes may, may, may look small, but they are not. Okay, I'm going to put this in log scale in a little bit, you will see these are actually very substantive changes. Now, we also often use a statistic called Kelly skewness to measure you know, uh, uh, the extent of skewness and it's defined um, as you see here, uh, you take the right tail, the, 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 the 90th percentile, 50th percentile differential, that's the size of the right tail. You subtract the size of the left tail, the 50, 10 differential, and then you scale it with the overall dispersion. This is a, a, this is a better measure than the third centralized moments for several reasons. It is robust to outliers, but more importantly, uh, it has a much simpler economic interpretation. <clears throat> so let me first show you the pattern. And I think it's clear here, it's like clockwork. You know, if you look at this, this skewness measure, in every recession, it dips. After the recession, it comes back up again. Okay, it dips, comes up again, dips, comes up again, and so on. Now, in terms of magnitudes, for example, the Kelly skewness here is like 0.25 in the early 2000s recession. In the uh, Great Recession, it's like minus 35. How big is that? If you take a Kelly skew of minus 0.3, it means that the left tail of the income change distribution is twice as long as the right tail. And look at how, how uh, quickly that happens, right? Right before the Great Recession, the skewness is positive. And in two years, you have this big change in the shock distribution that households get. <clears throat> So let's turn to the firms. The second main you know, um, finding is the same is true for firms. I will show you sales growth now, then I will switch to other variables in, in a moment. But if you look at uh, sales growth, this is the US CompuStat, you see the same pattern. You see actually a larger expansion of the left tail. The right tail here is not as visible. I will show you the log picture, which actually will make this clearer right here. <clears throat> So this is not the density, this is the log density. So you can actually see the tails more clearly and you can see how big the, the, the uh, uh, flattening of the left tail, okay? And the thinning of the right tail. If you look at the time series of the Kelly skewness for sales growth, again, you see exactly the same pattern. So what does this mean? Basically what we are looking at is uh, in recessions, you know, we know that idiosyncratic risk goes up, 
I mean, you know, if you live in this world, if you look around, uh, you don't even have to look at data very closely. Uh, we know there's more idiosyncratic risk, both for firms and for workers. But the way it happens is not through the expansion of variance as we have commonly been modeling, as previous uh, uh, evidence indicated. And I won't go into all the details of why actually we used to find um, uh, a counter variance in, in the US data. Uh, we discussed this in the papers that I'm citing, I'm going to cite today. But the, the, the basic punchline is that uh, we were relying on, or we meaning the literature has relied on highly parametric econometric processes that basically put restrictions. For example, in the studies that found counter variance, there was a, 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 you imposed a zero skewness. Okay, the process actually was uh, Gaussian, so you could not have any skewness to begin with. That's why in the papers and the results I'm going to show you today, uh, they are all very non-parametric. Now later, you know, once you have the non-parametric results and you realize that skewness really fluctuates, it's very important, then we and others, you know, go back and we write parametric models now that allow for skewness to fluctuate. And when you do that, actually, you get the correct results. You find a flat variance and you find a, a procyclical skewness over time. Um, so the roadmap uh, for, for um, uh, the rest of my talk, I'm going to basically um, start with firms and I'm going to show you uh, a variety of firm level outcome variables and firm level shocks. So there is of course the chicken and egg question, right? You know, if we see that the sales growth distribution becomes left skewed in a recession, do we read this as the recession happened due to another shock, for example, an aggregate shock, and it resulted in the sales growth distribution becoming negatively skewed. That's one way to look at it. The other way is that the fundamental shock that drives the business cycle is not an aggregate shock. It is actually a shock that is idiosyncratic. It's a change in the shock distribution to firms that makes it more, more negative, which itself triggers you know, changes in aggregates. I will talk about that, but right now think about both outcome variables being negatively skewed and the shocks uh, to, to the firms. Uh, I'll talk about some evidence from the US uh, internationally. I'll talk about some robustness and I will show you some really very, very new survey data uh, during COVID, uh, which again shows the same uh, uh, pattern that, that is common to, to uh, uh, historical data. Uh, I realized preparing my slides that uh, I won't have much time to talk about the VAR evidence. I will just say a few words and uh, the VAR evidence confirms that skewness shocks that you identify in uh, the US data uh, actually does create a big fall in uh, aggregates like GDP uh, uh, consumption and so on. And we also um, have, I'll summarize a business cycle model with skewness shocks and the results from that. Uh, then I will turn to workers and this will be more brief, uh, but I will talk about what do we know? You know, some of this work goes, you know, several years, but there's also very recent results from international data from uh, a, a project that uh, I'm involved in. Uh, it's called the Global Income Dynamics Project uh, with Luigi Pistaferi and Gianluca Violante and uh, about 50, 54 economists around the world. And, uh, we, we now that this project uh, has 13 different papers written and uh, every paper looks at the skewness fluctuation in the, the respective countries. And you find again, um, uh, the same pattern. If I have time, I will also talk briefly about uh, does government policy smooth these fluctuations like the tax and transfer system. So how much of the changes in income, uh, uh, pre-government income gets translated into uh, disposable income. So the first, in the first part, I'm going to rely, uh, um, uh, it will be based on this paper I have with uh, Sergio Salgado at Wharton and uh, Nick Bloom at Stanford. And it has two parts. In the first part, um, 
The data that we use will be from the US. It will be census data and CompuStat data. Uh, internationally, we are going to use data both from Orbis, uh, CompuStat Global, and OSIRIS. Uh, it will cover about 40 plus countries uh, for more than 40, uh, 20 years. And there's like millions and millions of data points uh, in this data, data set when you put them together. Um, then I'm going to show you some robustness across industries by firm characteristics and so on. And um, like I said, we have some new results uh, that I will talk about on COVID. And uh, so these results about that, that I summarized, they come from the paper with uh, Sergio and, and uh, Nick. <clears throat> now we also have a model. I will just briefly mention it because I will not be able to go into details. We view this as a first model. You know, how do you introduce uh, skewness into business cycle models? It's an extension of um, uh, a collection of recent models with similar features. We, are, we have uh, risk averse entrepreneurs that face financial constraints, capital adjustment costs. We are now revising this paper. So we also have labor adjustment costs um, and many other potential frictions. Uh, the reason we have all of them is because we want to make sure that the, uh, the skewness in outcomes that we see, okay, are not driven by those uh, endogenous features inside the model. We want to isolate how much of it is coming from the driving process, the TFP process into firms being uh, uh, the, the skewness of it being procyclical. So we want to draw that distinction. That's why we uh, try to make it rich so we can isolate the effect of different uh, uh, components. Um, so the macro impact, let me just give you like one bottom line number if you want to keep in mind. Uh, if you shock this model uh, with a skewness shock that is calibrated to the US data, uh, and the calibration is going from the average skewness that I showed you in the previous pictures in a recession to the average skewness in a recession, uh, it, cause, it, it basically is followed with a decline in output in GDP that's about 1.7%. And that's really large. Um, I don't want to put too much weight on exactly this magnitude, but you know we have various uh, robustness of this. And in general, you always find something that is uh, pretty significant. Um, then we add variance shocks, and then actually you find that variance shocks in a way weakens the effect of skewness. And the reason is the right tail that I mentioned before. Right? If the right tail expands, there's there some opportunities coming from that. So skewness, so in a way, the summary of, of uh, this discussion is that um, idiosyncratic shocks in recessions are in a way worse than what we thought. Okay, when the variance goes up, the left tail goes, uh, 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 the downside risk rises, but upside potential opportunities also rise. With skewness, you have the downside, but none of the upside. That's why it has a bigger impact than variance shocks. There is a long literature that you know we are building on and that are related. Um, that, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to to to, to skip. <clears throat> so let me now go back and uh, dig a bit deeper into the the evidence on firms. So I showed you the last left figure in a, a moment ago. This is again the histogram of sales growth shifting to the left. On the right now, again, this is US data, but this is from the census LBD and this is employment growth. And you see the same pattern. You see again, the left tail expanding, the right tail, you know, getting thinner. So it is, you know, not only sales, also employment. If you look at the log scale, you see it much more clearly. You know, you can do some simple calculations, you know, like the gap, for example, uh, these, this is in log scale. So the probability of, um, uh, if you look at the, for example, the, 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 the left panel, the probability of a minus one log shock. So that is about a decline in income um, of roughly 65%, okay? Uh, in a recession, the probability of that more than doubles. Okay, if you look at employment, you find similarly large numbers. <clears throat> so, okay, this is, this is nice, you know, so sales growth and employment growth become more negatively skewed. If you plot over time, this is what I showed you a minute ago, 
Now I'm going to show you the analog of this for employment growth. And it looks very similar, okay? It's like clockwork. Every recession, you know, you have employment growth being ne negatively skewed. Recession ends, you move back to positively skewed. I mean, I also want to be clear about this. You know, we talk about left skew in recession, but there's also the mirror image happening in expansions, okay? I mean, if you look at, for example, the Great Recession in this figure, uh, you know, you are at minus 0.2 Kelly skewness in 2008. And by 2009, you are back to plus one. Okay, there's a big surge actually in skewness. So growth happens with positive skewness and decline happens with negative. Now, one question that, that we might think about is which tail drives it? You know, because we think about uh, downside risk as being left tail. And it turns out that both tails are, you know, similarly important. Um, so if you look at here, the black line is the, the, the left tail. In every recession, the left tail becomes larger, it jumps, you know, in like you see all these peaks here. And, uh, but the same is true, the opposite is true for P9050. A recession comes, P9050 dips, you know, all the way down and then goes up and then dips again. So uh, we don't want to think about uh, skewness just being a left tail shock. You know, if we model it that way, we are going to miss a big part of the story, which is that for many variables, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I think there are some variables for which the left tail uh, drives more of the skewness, maybe 60% of the fluctuations in skewness. But in many variables, both actually uh, matter a lot. Now, robustness, how does this look across, for example, firm sizes? You know, I, I'm not going to go over every single one of them, but here you can look at by small firms, big firms. You can look at firms versus establishments. You can allow entry and exit of firms. You can look at different measures of skewness, different, you know, uh, ages of firms. We have, you know, quite a bit more than what you see here in the paper and you really robustly get the same, same pattern. Now, I want to turn to international data. And, uh, you know, rather than showing you 44 graphs, one for each country, we are going to pool all of them into one picture that summarizes, you know, a lot of what's going on. So let me explain how the graph is constructed. Take one of these circles here, you know, the one that basically is at the top. Um, this is for one, country year pair, okay? So for example, for this country in this circle at the top, in that year, log employment growth in that country was something like, I think this is a five year change though. I think the note is incorrect. Uh, this is a five year change of, uh, uh, we look at a five year horizon. So this is a country and five year uh, 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 cell. And the employment growth was about 13% during that, that uh, period for that country. And the cross-sectional skewness of employment growth across firms in that country was something like positive 0.33. So this is a very positive skewness. So each one of these are constructed the same. And as you see, they all line up beautifully along this line. What does this tell us? Well, it basically shows the same figure from before. Every time employment grows fast, the skewness of employment growth is positive. When it shrinks, the employment growth skewness is also negative. And if you look at the right side, this is also true for a sales growth. Um, so this, this now pulls 44 countries. If you are curious about one by one, which country does what, out of 44 countries, if I remember correctly, there was one country or two maybe that was not significantly procyclical. So if you look country by country, you find the same pattern within each country. You know, it's not coming from pooling and putting things together. Now let's turn to now the uh, international evidence on TFP shocks, because this is the driving process um, and that we take exogenous in, in a lot of models. Uh, the, the one on the left is uh, for uh, from Amadeus, this is international data. The one on the right is for the US. It is from the survey of manufacturers. And we 
estimate TFP shocks at the firm level using three different methods that are quite conventional. Um, and they basically all give you the same picture that the skewness of, of TFP shocks to firms becomes negative in recessions and positive in expansions. Now let's go again back to the US. Is this also true for skewness within each industry? So to show you this, uh, I'll use another summary. <clears throat> uh, so the equation that you see here, KSK is the Kelly skewness, J is an industry, T is here. So this is the skewness of, for example, in this figure, it is sales growth. Okay, within a given industry year sell. And we regress this on the sales growth in that industry. So here I'm not using GDP. Okay, when I say procyclical, I am using a measure of industry level uh, uh, GDP, if you will. Okay, I'm also gonna do the GDP one in a moment. But if you start with this, the beta tells you the procyclicality of skewness. And here you have, you know, uh, I think 15 or so um, uh, the, the, uh, um, aggregated industries. And for every single one of them, beta is positive. And this is from CompuStat. It's a selected sample of large firms. Uh, but if you look at LBD and do this for employment, again, you find the same, the same picture. Let's go. Let's go here. <clears throat> now, I can do the same thing for skewness within each one of the 44 countries. Okay, not comparing across countries like I did before, but take the GDP of a given country. J now is not industry, it is, uh, um, uh, it is the GDP of that country and the Kelly is the skewness of, you know, um, um, firm output growth during this period. And again, with the exception of Hungary, Greece and Italy, because they are not, you know, significant, uh, all the rest are, are significantly um, uh, procyclical. And the red line actually shows you the US. So in a way, you know, the, there are other countries that are much more cyclical even than the US. <clears throat> now you can do more robustness in the sense that you can actually look at stock returns. Okay, now I'm going to do a more expanded regression where I change the definition of what a cycle is what variables I, you know, use, like can it be the stock market returns, the sales in the industry, the employment in the industry, the GDP, and so on. And I'm not going to go into uh, each one of them, but here you can, you can see the coefficients that in every case, they are highly significant and also economically significant. Um, now, I want to show you, um, I think I have maybe 17, 18 minutes left. Uh, so let me move on to some uh, very new survey evidence. And the, 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 my co-author Nick Bloom on this paper uh, is involved in two surveys. Um, the first one is here in the US and there's another one in the UK. This is a survey of firms asking about their expectations um, in a, on, a, on a monthly basis and also collecting data on their actual you know, sales and other performance measures. So this one is one figure that I think uh, looks pretty striking because this is a measure of subjective uncertainty um, of firms. You have the US and the UK here and they look very similar. It was very flat before COVID, before basically, you know, the first couple of months of 2020. And then you have this huge surge um, in, in uncertainty expectations. You know, it goes from three to six, which roughly it's an in, you can think about like a doubling of, of uh, the, the uncertainty. Now, if you go deeper and look at the percentiles, okay, this is basically uh, uh, the expectations of the firm owners, managers about their own future sales growth. Okay, they are asked to basically put probabilities on different growth rate scenarios looking forward. And you have different percentiles here, you know, the, the 10th, the 25th, the median 75th and 90th. And again, it's very stable until, you know, COVID hits. And when COVID hits, you see basically the bottom falling out, right? Now firms, instead of expecting the 10th percentile was 0%, but now with COVID, they expect a 20% decline in their sales. 
And the same, interestingly, you know, is true in the UK. If you just, you know, step back and look at both figures, it's pretty striking actually how, how broadly similar they are. You know, you see some evidence at the top of better expectations at the top, which were not realized by the way. Um, but if you look at the, 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 the median, for example, the median also goes down, but less than the, seven, the, the 25th, which is less than the 10th. So the bottom end uh, spreads out and the top end uh, um, shrinks a little bit. Now, if you look at the Kelly skewness of the expectations that I showed you, you see the same pattern. You know, uh, the left is uh, sales growth, the right is employment growth. It was pretty stable up all the way to January 2020. And by the time you are in February and March, April, you start completely tanking. And the skewness, rem remember the, the discussion at the beginning that a Kelly skewness of minus 0.3 means the left tail is twice as big as large as the right tail. So the economy went from, you know, in January, 2020, uh, having a Kelly skewness of 0.3, which is the right tail is two thirds of, uh, sorry, the right tail is twice as big as the left tail. In six months, it completely reversed. And when you come out of the recession, you also come out the same way. Um, I don't think I have that in this slide, but actually we have, yeah, I think we can, yeah, right now I think that's not kind of uh, cleared yet for, for, for um, public consumption. And if you look at the actual sales, you know, not only um, uh, the expectations, that has also been um, left skewed. So this is the response to a question that says, by what percentage did the impact of COVID 19 raise or lower your firm sales over a quarter? And indeed, <clears throat> nobody, I mean, some people had a little bit rise in their sales, but a lot more firms had big declines in their sales. Now, why don't I call this, you know, an, an aggregate shock? Again, because the center does not move nearly as much, okay? The center, there is a very stable center of these distributions, but the tails are moving a lot more. <clears throat> so, um, if you are just curious, we talk about this in, the, in, in this particular paper about the data sources and what it covers. I think I reviewed these at the beginning, so I'm going to, to skip here. Uh, we also discussed the data sources, the sample selection, robustness to different selection criteria uh, in, in this paper. Now, I want to briefly give you uh, uh, the outline of the model. Um, that we use to quantify <clears throat> the potential effect of, of uh, a negative skewness shock. So this is a small open economy. And there are two types of agents. <clears throat> you have risk averse entrepreneurs. They produce output in their firm. They own capital, they rent labor, and then they consume. Households, they only supply labor and consume. So their problem is uh, much more simplified, which is, which is pretty common in this context. So the entrepreneurs are the ones actually uh, that we model in more detail. Uh, they are subject to idiosyncratic shocks to their firm. And this process is quite rich. Uh, if you are familiar, for example, uh, some of the work that, that uh, uh, Nick Bloom, my co-author has done <clears throat> in his 2009 econometrical paper, but also in his more recent you know, uh, paper, the really, business, really uncertain business cycles paper, uh, you can think about this model in some ways as an expansion of the shock process that they use there, okay? By introducing skewness that can also fluctuate <clears throat> over the business cycle, excuse me. Uh, there, are, there are three types of capital adjustment costs. There's a fixed one, there's a, there a, a irreversibility, and there's a convex one. Um, you cannot borrow, so the firm has to be self-financing. And there's, a, there's a, a portfolio choice problem. Your only option is not to invest in your firm. You can also save in a risk-free asset. So the model <clears throat> actually generates a lot of non-linearities in the response of entrepreneurs to uh, skewness shocks. So um, <clears throat> this is basically uh, the impulse response functions in response to a one uh, 
one standard deviation of skewness shock uh, only to the idiosyncratic component. Okay, in this picture, the aggregate TFP shock is constant. Okay, the variance of firm level shocks are constant, but the skewness is one standard deviation, you know, shocked down. And uh, this is the this is what I um, uh, said at the beginning. This is, was a summary I gave. If you look at output in about uh, six quarters, seven quarters, you go down by about 1.7%. Um, in the robustness that we have, sometimes this is like, you know, minus 1%, sometimes one and a half. So, like I said, you know, uh, I won't put, uh, I, I, I won't basically emphasize too much the exact magnitude, but the different uh, robustness that we did always yields something that is uh, pretty comparable to the effect of other aggregate shocks that, 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 that uh, has been studied. <clears throat> and you look at uh, investment in capital. There's a big drop by about 15%, and there's a rather slow recovery. And I'm going to contrast that in just a moment to variance shocks, okay? Because if you are familiar with the literature, we know that variance shocks cause a decline, but then a rapid uh, rebound. Uh, consumption, again, declines by about 1% and recovers, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty prolonged. And... Um, what happens then? Why isn't there an investment? Uh, uh, um, wh why does investment decline? Because now you have an outside option. You can actually put your money in the risk-free asset. Sometimes in these models, if you have a closed economy, the money has nowhere else to go. Okay, so if you have more uncertainty uh, counterfactually, uh, you can get, for example, investment also go up. And here we don't have that because we give the, the entrepreneurs an option. You can think about this as investing abroad. Uh, or investing in some other asset that is not really directly productive. Now let's add the variance shock on top of this. Um, so if you look at output, the initial decline is deeper instead of, for example, the 1.7% at eight quarter horizon, you get maybe one point, I don't know, nine, like it's not that big, but it's earlier. Uh, it happens more quickly, but then the recovery is much faster. And, uh, and the reasons for these are, I think, well understood, you know, uh, <clears throat> so in the interest of time, I will, I will not uh, go too much into that, but basically it comes from the comment I made at the beginning that the, the, the right tail gives you uh, this opportunity of basically uh, taking advantage of, of, of that uh, positive shock. Firms that get the positive shock, they can actually go and invest more and they can produce more. So you go and, um, recover more quickly. It creates a bigger investment decline, but again, the recovery is much faster. Um, consumption decline is bigger with the variance shock if you combine the two, but the recovery is again faster. <clears throat> so like I said, we change different parameters in the model, the adjustment cost, the risk aversion, and you get you know the qualitative, the same, same set of results. Now, uh, I want to turn in the last uh, seven minutes that I have, uh, as I promised, I'm going to show you some, um, a few pieces of evidence and partly because some of this work uh, goes a bit before, you know, the work on firms is more recent. Um, so today I'm just going to show you a few key figures on what happens to workers. <clears throat> so let's go back to the question at the beginning, right? Uh, I showed you that, do I have this here? Yes. Um, I showed you this figure at the beginning showing that, you know, um, uh, the Kelly skewness of earnings growth in the US is strongly procyclical. But I did not say anything about the variance. So, what happens to the variance of income growth uh, over, during a recession? If my computer cooperates. Okay. <clears throat> So the blue line that you see here, these are really, really very simple statistics. And there's a reason why I show you this first. Uh, in this paper with, with uh, Jay and Serdar, we estimate also an income process, a stochastic process with bells and whistles, um, with a normal mixture distribution to allow, you know, skewness and variance change. And you get the same results that I show you here. But I think these are much cleaner and easier to explain. This is basically take one year income change of workers in the US, 
and then take the, the standard deviation, the cross-sectional standard deviation of that and plot over time. And do you see any change in the recession? No, right? I mean, or very small, maybe 1990, there was a little blip in, 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 in the standard deviation. In the 2000 recession, look at the scale of it. The standard deviation went from maybe 0.5 to point maybe 55, okay? By all practical purposes, these are really small you know, uh, changes. In the Great Recession, you find something even less. Uh, <clears throat> because if we take the, the typical numbers estimated in the literature and used in uh, a lot of macro models, they imply a tripling of the variance of persistent shocks. So this is standard deviation. If you do the mapping, I would have expected to see a 75, 80% increase in the standard deviation in recession. So if I am at 0.55 here, I would have expected to jump to 0.8 in standard deviation, but we don't see that. And uh, in a recent paper that, that with, with uh, Chris Bush, uh, David Tomei and Rocio Madera, it is forthcoming in the AJ macro. Uh, we look at in some international evidence, but we also use the same survey data, the PSID data that previous papers that found countercyclical variance used. So we try to disentangle. Was it that there was something wrong with the survey data that yielded the evidence on, on uh, variance rising in recessions? Or was it that the parametric, the, the, the Gaussian linear models that we have been using, did they kind of give the impression that the variance rises? And it turns out it was the methodology because you see the same pattern I show you uh, in the PSID in the US, okay? Uh, now, maybe it doesn't show up in one year change. Maybe you see it in five year change. No, you don't, right? That's the red line, okay? So it's very hard to see any evidence of uh, counter covariance in income shocks uh, in the US. Now, how about other countries? Uh, before I get to that, uh, the, the figure I showed you, it's robust for like men and women by you know, age groups across different industries. If you rank, if you rank workers by their permanent income, and by that, I mean, take a five-year average income, which is a proxy for permanent income. And you look at how much did variance of income shocks change over the business cycle for different income groups. Basically it was flat for every group, which is pretty striking actually. You know, like from the, the, the lowest income group to the highest income group, uh, even though these groups have very different levels of variances, but the change over the business cycle is uniformly very small. Now, um, I was I, I, I was guessing that you know at this point I would be out of time. So rather than showing you slides, I just want to uh, briefly summarize in two minutes uh, what is the current evidence uh, from uh, you know uh, what do we know in a way or what's the latest? Uh, there are several papers that has been written, uh, and I cannot do justice to to every paper. There are papers by you know, um, Hoffman and Malacrino, for example, from Italy. Um, there are papers by uh, Chris Bush and Alexander Ludwig from Germany. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a paper I mentioned with myself and Chris Bush and David Dome and uh, Rocio Madera, which looks at different countries, you know, around the world. Uh, but now more systematically, uh, the Global Income Dynamics Project, um, I don't have a link, I apologize here, but you know, if you go to my website, there's actually a link to the project and all the working papers. So you can see it for yourself, how it looks, for example, in the UK, in Canada, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil. And you see the same pattern in all these countries, okay? There is, I think the one exception is Sweden, um, in, except for Sweden and partially Spain, the variance has been flat in all of these countries. It does not go up basically, it's not counter -cyclical. but the skewness is robustly pro-cyclical in, in these different countries. <clears throat> now, you can think about different cuts of the data or different types of robustness. For example, are these negative tail shocks and positive you know, compression happening because of unemployment? Okay, well, 
it turns out that the same pattern is true for full-time workers. How about maybe it's job-to-job -job changes? It's also true for firm stayers. Is it hours and wages? It turns out to be both. Both become negatively skewed. But if you just look at hourly wages, they are also, they also have uh, procyclical skewness. Um, in, in our paper that, that uh, I have here, we also looked at policy. And if there are any questions, I'm very happy to, to answer them dur during Q&A. Uh, and the effectiveness of government in smoothing these shocks, as you can imagine, depends on, you know, uh, how much the government wants to smooth these shocks. So you get more smoothing, for example, in Sweden and Germany, uh, as opposed to the US. But there's a lot of colors and a lot of kind of unexpected uh, dimensions of that too. And, um, and that's, also, that's also partly ongoing work by, by other authors too, uh, as part of the Global Income Dynamics Project and, and elsewhere. So I will just leave the conclusion slide and um, um, not repeat it, I'll just leave it here and I'll stop here if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Fatih, for this great presentation. So if anybody has a question, please open your mic and, and ask. Ernesto, go ahead. Hello, thank you so much for this great presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, question one is whether you have explored the uh, asset prices implications of, of the of, uh, the skewness in, in, in models mm -hmm. and, and whether the evidence is also consistent with the story uh, mm -hmm. that you're been pushing forward. The second one is um, about policy. So, you start saying that this matters for macro and matters for policy. So the question I have is whether this should really change the way that we should think about macro policy to manage cycles, <clears throat> or is really a call for another type of policies, let's say more micro oriented policies, more uh, directed to solve uh, market failures for uh, uh, an insurable income risk or something like that. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you. I mean, these are both really excellent questions. Uh, on, on the first one, there are uh, several papers that uh, have looked at the effect of uh, negatively skewed income shocks for asset pricing. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, one of the uh, a very good paper by Larry Schmidt, who is at MIT right now. He takes a standard like you know uh, asset pricing model with idiosyncratic shocks uh, like Konstantin Des and Duffy. But rather than having variance shocks, he actually has skewness shocks. And then he finds that you can improve <clears throat> the, the uh, asset pricing implications of models pretty significantly. Again, it goes to the same idea that, you know, in variance, you also have an upside uh, option. So this, in a way, makes the, the shocks more painful <clears throat> than the variance shocks. We have a calculation. We did some risk premium calculation in another paper. And what we found is that the, the skewness component of uh, income shocks can, can create a risk premium that is anywhere two to three times larger than the variance component. Another paper, uh, 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 George Konstantinides has two papers. One is by um, uh, Konstantinides and Gosh, and one on his own recently, where they make the same point. Okay, they do some calculations and they find that you know skewness contributes significantly. One of my favorite papers, though, is by Sylvan Catherine, who is at Wharton, and what he looked at is is like a very subtle implication of skewness. And the implication is this: if you have background risk as an investor, uh, you are going to invest less in risky assets, right? You know, you are going to tilt more towards risk-free assets because you you cannot the. Um, diversify what you have. So he looked at the portfolio shares by different occupations. I believe this data was from France. And now he has a paper with uh, Swedish data where he looked at the skewness of income shocks in a given occupation. And he looked at the portfolio shares in risky assets of workers in that occupation. He merged two data sets. And lo and behold, you find this subtle implication that honestly, I wasn't sure if you would find, but you do find a pretty strong relationship. 
that workers that have more negatively skilled income shocks, they don't like investing in the stock market. Now, one reason this matters, I did not show you today, but workers at the very, very top of the income distribution, like the top 1%, top 0.1%, they actually have a very systematic business cycle risk. Okay, this is a different dimension of, of uh, uh, skewness. Um, for example, the top 0.1%, those who were in top 0.1% before the Great Recession were 50% lower in income five years after the recession. So it's a pretty personal shock. So then that has implications for portfolio choice, but also the equity premium. Because if they don't want to hold the stock, but suppose that you have to hold uh, some amount because you are a manager, right? You know, then this will, you will require a higher return to, to, to do that. <clears throat> As for your second question, um, to me, like all these different data points point to even like a more, uh, a different theory of what drives business cycles. Because, you know, if you spend looking at all these data from different countries, different variables, and everything you look at in business cycles turns out to be about the skewness. So, you know, there are papers that I'm sure you know about, like by Xavier, Xavier Gebek wrote several years ago about the, the granular origins of agri fluctuations. And <clears throat> so here, uh, it really looks like uh, the shock is not to the aggregate, it is to the tails, you know? Uh, uh, the, the center may be 50% in the middle from roughly the median to 90th percentile, they are pretty stable, okay? But then you get this big skewness shock to both tails. And that gets reflected, like in the great recession example, we look at the aggregate data, we say there's a big fall in, in GDP. We say there's a big fall in, in uh, incomes. But GDP is a combination of all the firms in the economy. And then when their sales become negatively skewed, it gets reflected in the mean, but not the median. That's why I was drawing the distinction. So, this is in a way like one level above policy, right? You know, if we think that what drives the business cycle is different, then that will have implications for, for policy. Um, but it also, has it also has implications for a lot of welfare and social insurance policies that I think are very important. Um, because here, what we see is uh, the left tail is really expanding a lot more than the way we typically calibrate it. <clears throat> so, this is like a general answer, but I think, you know, um, um, for example, in Sweden and in Germany, when we looked at different parts of the welfare state, <clears throat> different components of insurance, some are a lot more effective at dampening the negative skewness in recessions than others. So it gives you an idea about what are more effective ways to deal with that. One thing we found, for example, couples are not good at all about insuring each other. Like households have as much fluctuation in skewness as individuals, which sounds surprising, right? Because you might think that, you know, one cup a spouse gets a negative shock, the other one kind of, you know, goes and works more. We didn't find any evidence of that. <clears throat> so in a way there are more open questions than answers at this point, you know, but it's, I think the, the, the direction is something I find quite uh, exciting. Are there any other questions? Can I ask a, ask a question? Ask sure, now. go ahead. Danny. Thank you. Uh, thanks for very interesting, terrific presentation. Just two questions. Uh, I was thinking to COVID. You know, COVID is common, normally thought as a shock that has increased, widely increased uncertainty. So I was wondering whether uh, the combination of an increase in uncertainty and borrowing constraint, occasionally binding borrowing mm -hmm. constraint, can produce effects that at least um, uh, that are observationally equivalent to to a shock to to skewness. First, this is my first question. So, it would be at least from an empirical perspective, differ, difficult to to identify them, to distinguish among each other. The second question is. You, you, your talk was about the, the regular business cycle. And I was wondering uh, uh, um, if uh, you can say something about uh, crisis. So that implied a huge and sudden drop 
in output. So if skewness, uh, if you have some evidence or you have some thought about uh, this, yeah. I mean, yeah. Thank sure. you. Thank you. I mean, these are again excellent questions. Um, on the first one, so. Um, um, so uncertainty has become, in a way, equated to various shocks. And that partly goes to, you know, again, Nick's work, where, you know, um, he wanted to talk about uncertainty rising. And the way he modeled it is, was with variance. But when we talk about skewness become more negative, that is an uncertainty shock, OK? So it's, you know, like the terminology, in a way, has to change to adapt to that. And what we are. Uh, what our model says is that um, uh, it shows that uncertainty rises more than we thought by looking at the variance. Okay, so in that sense, you know, it will have, of course, uh, uh, th th that was the model part that I briefly went over. But for aggregates, yes, it actually will have bigger implications. Uh, uh, the, the, the main difference also is it's more prolonged because the skewness change that we find is there in the persistent component of variables, not the transit. I mean, the transfer is there too, but you know, um, firms that have a big drop, they don't quickly recover. It takes them a very long time to recover. Mm -hmm. uh, as to your second question, uh, yes. So the, for example, the, the Global Income Dynamics Project, <clears throat> we have several Scandinavian countries. Uh, so the 1993 period, the three years, uh, that recession was very mild in the US. But actually, it was very, very big in Sweden. <clears throat> it was, I think, the largest recession they had you know, before and after. Um, and it was triggered. It was related to a financial crisis. And what you see there is uh, you see actually the largest decline in skewness of any country that we have seen. I think it goes from like plus 0.2, the Kelly skewness, to minus 0.4 in the span of like a couple of years. Um, so like Norway is the same. Denmark is the same. So they had a big recession. Uh, uh, Norway was a bit earlier. Uh, and the Great Recession, to the extent that it's a financial shock, you know, you had a huge swing in, in skewness. It was like in the figures, if you, if you, you know, that, that saw them, you see in incomes, but you also see in firm uh, outcome variables and TFP shocks and, and, and so on. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the cross-sectional figure I showed actually showed that it's true for uh, across the board of income growth rates, right? The, 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 the uh, scatter plot kind of, you know, it doesn't happen in middle levels. It happens in the tails as well. <clears throat>